Okay. Yes, I can see the screen. Yes. I think you are able to see the screen. Yes. So, uh, Hipsol Life Technologies uh, is the company uh, that uh, I have founded. So, at Hipsol, what we intend to do is we try to redefine agri inputs, the biological inputs by technology. So, we, we are a spin-off from IIT Madras. We were founded in 2013. And uh, we bring cutting edge science into agriculture. So the core team consists of IITs with expertise in various aspects, including biochemistry, nanotechnology, microbiology, and polymer science. Uh, we have experience of over 20 plus years, and uh, we have a business strategic team of 40 plus year experience. We are mentored by industry leaders on science and business front. And we are currently being marketed by Thousand Farms Agritech and Ventura. And also, these are the various uh, patents that we have on the technologies in agriculture. You can see that we have almost four patents in agriculture and one is something different. And what, what, what is it about? Why are we talking about biological inputs? Uh, so we definitely need to come up with good quality biofertilizers. Uh, this is to improve the soil quality. Uh, we have to improve the soil texture. We have to increase the nutrient utilization and we have to decrease uh, chemicals by 50%. And we have to improve the water quality. So by using good biofertilizer, we can actually reduce chemicals and we can prevent leaching of chemicals. We have to improve the air quality because uh, uh, now when we are making chemical fertilizers for every ton of chemicals that we produce, we are liberating a ton of carbon dioxide. So that can be actually prevented. And uh, the far farmer's fiscal burden is also reduced because he is going to use less amount of chemicals. Now, when I say biofertilizer, what is the characteristic of a good or efficient biofertilizer? The cell count uh, should be around 10 to the power of 8 CFU per gram. There should be no contamination. The stability should be at least for six months. So this is what the fertilizer control order of the country recommends. Uh, and if you can see that when we have uh, good biofertilizers, it also prevents fertilizer leaching. So that is a very important uh, now, why is this very important or why are we thinking of these biological inputs? Because we see that soil degradation is a common problem and there is, in spite of applying more of nitrogen fertilizers, there is a very deficient state of nitrogen in, in at least 90% of the state. And now fourfold more chemical fertilizers has to be used in order to improve the nutrient utilization and uh, the absorption is still very less. It is only 40% of what we are actually applying. The solution is going to be a good quality biological. So by giving a good quality biological, this particular farmer was able to reduce his chemical inputs, say very uh, significantly, uh, almost at the level of 60%. And he was also able to improve his yield by 30%. And Fipsol is basically a soil microbial input which is 1,000 times concentrated and two times more stable. The technology that we have is an entrapment uh, technology. So now let, let me just explain the technology. So this is encapsulation in a biodegradable polymer and the concentration of the bacterial cell is almost 10 to the power of 11 CFU per ml. And so we recommend 100 ml pouches, which means we have 10 to the power of 13 CFU in 100 ml. And this is 1,000 times higher than the conventionally available biofertilizer formulation. The technology is simple. We encapsulate in protective sheath of polymers. And uh, the polymer is biodegradable and eco-friendly. Since the polymer is water-soluble, this is very easy to apply also. The graph that shows blue color, which is Fipsol, and the orange color is the commercial fertilizer that is available, biofertilizer that's available in the market. You can see within second month, the counts in the commercial biofertilizer poster, this is the viable bacterial count actually. 
But whereas in Fibsol till 18th month, you see that the counts are uh, stable. So this is what technology does. And you can also see the level of the count. It is almost 10 to the power of, or you can see it here, 12. And we are FCO certified. We are also certified by TNAU, GKVK, and Jiranga Agricultural University. And the patent uh, on this is granted. And we've also filed a PCT. And this is how it is. Like because of the high payload, we just need 100 ml of the product. You can see it's just a small pouch. You see the farmer here holding the pouch instead of big bulky bags. You, it's like a small tomato ketchup sachet or something. And uh, they, it's a very good soil conditioner. It reduces carbon footprint and the farmer finds it very easy to apply. And now, uh, these are the new product portfolios that we have. So we have Sakti Surya, the Nutrigel Plus, Soil Gel, Trigel and Kajal. And uh, we are being marketed by some of the companies. And if you see like uh, the trials behind this, so we have been trialing with uh, uh, GKVK, Njuranga Agriculture Universities. We've also trialed with some of the foundations and we've also trialed with uh, some of the aggregators. So various states, various regions, geographically we have tried. And the major crops for which we have detailed scientific uh, documentation is groundnut, tomato, maize, and paddy. Mostly we go by soil spray, manure mix, and seed coating. Uh, we also can do uh, uh, foliar application in case for the second uh, coating. And in all cases, you see that there is a very uh, good increase in yield. Uh, so somewhere from 15 to maximum of 60% is what you see in most of the cases. And yeah, so here you can see the summary, entire summary, what all has happened, what are the specific characteristics in each crop. Uh, paddy, you have, you always find that the root length increases within 15 days of application. And uh, you also see that there is 40% more tillers. Uh, in tomato, we have seen a very significant increase in the number of cuttings. So we've also seen farmers having a cutting of around 32 times in tomato by using Fipsol. And uh, veggies, the weight increases by around 20%. Maize, the cob weight increases. Ground at the pod, the, the pod weight increases. And it is very uniform in size. And in grapes, we see a very good uh, improvement in the fruit size. So specifically for each of the crop, you can see significant differences in some of the characteristic feature. Not stopping with this, we have done this in cotton, we've done this in tea, we've done this in uh, other crops where significantly some of the parameters has uh, proven to increase. Now you see this farmer, you will see, I don't have to tell you which is Fipsol, which is control. It is that evident. Now, uh, the proven facts are that the yield can be improved significantly and uh, the environmental in impact is very high, not only because we can reduce chemicals, because we are also giving a healthy crop, we can reduce the uh, uh, pesticides as well. So these are the advantages. Uh, now, the actives that we have uh, come up with in this common platform technology, uh, we have come up with the PGPR, including BAM. So this is actually, um, uh, like if you see the biofertilizer segment, we also have the biocontrol segment and then we have the uh, micronutrient segment. So in the last two years, so this is our uh, various sales channel and this is what we have made with this technology. Now let me just move into the next technology, which is the nanofiber technology. So here, this is how the product looks. So this patent is also granted. And here, if you see, we are able to load billions of bacteria in a small five to 15 gram tissue like paper. So this paper dissolves in water and then you can easily apply this on the field. So it is that easy to apply this technology. Uh, now when you talk about nano carriers, they have a very high surface volume ratio. So when I say surface volume ratio, uh, say suppose you have one gram. When you think of one gram, in case of salt, one gram is one pinch, right? In case of nanofiber, one gram can go up till one square meter. So the volume that you have is very high, which is available for loading more uh, materials, actives. And uh, we can also come up with differential degradation based on the thickness of the material and also the, mat the, the material that we are using. We can combine various material to arrive at a slow release or differential uh, releasing of the Actives. That's another advantage we have in these type of carriers. And uh, so if you see, 
all this is very beneficial because in agriculture there are some molecules that has to have a controlled release mainly the pesticides the pheromones and smart fertilizers some molecules it has to go a slow release mainly the fertilizers and some molecules instant release like biofertilizers so this technology is amenable to all these type of releases and apart from uh, agriculture they have a huge um, use in other fields of biotechnology as well and in our uh, vicinity or in our uh, labs that we have already tested loading uh, pesticides into these nanofibers you can clearly see this how uh, they look like and by doing this you can actually reduce the carrier materials that uh, people use in order to emulsify uh, pesticides so that is an advantage and also you can increase the actives and bring down the uh, material that is needed per acre that is an uh, method here we have developed using nanofibers we have developed a sensor which can actually sense the moisture in the grains so by doing that if there is even a trace of moisture it immediately changes color so the farmer can change the storage immediately so that this prevents post harvest loss and uh, we've also done this in other sectors apart from agriculture we've used this uh, nanotechnology and we also have a handheld device and this device is actually in case of agriculture this can be used for post harvest uh, loss uh, prevention but these are all at the technical still at the very nascent stage there's a lot of work to be done and now you go to this particular technology so this is another technology in uh, biological inputs which is using quorum sensing molecule this biostimulant so this is uh, something that is very uh, interesting because in this case you don't even have to make the biofertilizer the biostimulant itself acts as a signal for improving the quantity of the biofertilizers and uh, what we have done is we have done modification of the polymer using one of the biostimulants and uh, we use a particular technology to do that. By doing that, we are able to increase the shelf life of the quorum sensing molecule, say from 15 days to 60 days. So this can be used as a, a seedling wrap or it can be used as a sapling wrap and we can actually eliminate the use of other chemicals or even biofertilizers. So this is uh, the next level technology and this is also uh, patented and granted. And uh, of late, we are working with uh, artificial nodulation. So that is another technology that we are working with. And now this particular technology is actually functional soil microbial consortium identification. So we have entered into the uh, metagenomic space now. So now we are working with um, uh, this particular uh, heat map is from the traditional paddy rhizospheric region where we are analyzing the uh, soil microbiome. So using metagenomic as a tool. Now uh, the idea is to identify a core consortium which can work in different uh, geoclimatic conditions and different uh, crops. Uh, the core consortium uh, is to be designed as a seed coating or a sapling tip. So that is what we are actually planning. So apart from this, uh, some of the other technologies that Pipsol has, and these are the awards and uh, recognitions and various grants. And this is our core team, which works on the technical aspects and uh, our other director works on the business aspects. Uh, so this is what uh, is about us. But I would also want to go a step ahead and tell you that uh, there are a lot of other uh, technologies in, uh, uh, in a biological agri input. So people like we know, uh, are are mainly working on the uh, today people are working on the seaweed extracts like you see and uh, uh, there are other molecules that have come into the market uh, like say a myoinositol the antioxidants anti stresses to actually elevate abiotic stress factors and then we have uh, uh, a combination a consortium of the soil decomposing uh, bacteria that is commonly used which actually works on the vegetable waste or on the waste in the soil and degrade them to improve the carbon content of the soil in which the biofertilizer bacteria can then uh, grow so like this uh, there are various technologies that have come up in the agri input sector uh, now this is only on the nutrient management and the biocontrol but we also have molecules that have come up in the um, uh, if you say this is in the weed side or in the herbicide sector as well. So glycosides can be used as natural weedicides or herbicides to prevent the weeds and the herbs. So by doing this, what happens is we can actually uh, reduce 
the, the reduce uh, these 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 weeds and herbs, and we can improve the nutrient utilization of the uh, new, uh, the, the uh, to the plants. Now, what happens is. Mm, uh, there is one more thing. Uh, when we use natural uh, weedy side, again, we are protecting the biofertilizer molecules there or we are protecting the biostimulants there. So that is another advantage that we have. Uh, now, this sector is one thing. Of late, what we are doing is we are also working on another te technology, which is a, a functional uh, mulchy. So we are coming up with that technology for which we recently got uh, the Bayrak Grand Challenges India brand. So uh, that, that these are few of the technologies that we are uh, doing. And most of our technologies are amenable or most of our technologies can be actually um, deployed using drones. So this, it is very simple. It is a lightweight technology, which you can just use it uh, with a drone or something. So uh, I can show you some videos of how we deploy our products. Just give me uh, a minute. Yes, good. I think you are able to see the screen. Yes, yes. Nanofiber membranes are loaded with soil nutrient fixing microbes in 25 grams of tissue paper that dissolves easily in water, which can then be used to fertilize an acre of land. Conventional organic farmers have to use truckloads of manure and compost to fertilize an acre of land. With NFIB 20, they just have to carry a wafer-thin membrane packed in a tiny sachet that weighs about 25 grams and use it to fertilize an acre of land. Each membrane that hosts the fertilizing bacteria is made up of millions of nanofibers that serve as an ideal carrier for good microbes that fertilize the soil. Unlike conventional biofertilizers in the market, where the concentration of microbes changes according to various factors, this technology maintains a stable and high concentration of microbes per unit. In fact, the concentration of microbes in 1 gram is more than 10,000 times that of 1 gram of biofertilizers using conventional carriers. Applying Fibsol's NFIB20 is as easy as pie. One just has to open the sachet and dissolve the nanofiber membrane in water and irrigate the field or spray it on the crops. 
the farmer gets all these advantages in the same cost compared to competition. However, huge sums of money in transport of tons of biofertilizer can now be saved due to lower bulk density of FIB20 and also leading to minimal carbon footprint in the value chain. So this is one of our uh, innovations. I think you would have understood on how it works. Let me just uh, show you something else. On how the gel technology of Ipsol works. So yeah, uh, these are the various technologies that uh, we have, and this is how we uh, deploy. Deploy. I think we have. Uh, I have given a, a broad overview of what we do and uh, where we are, and what are the recent uh, technical advancements in biological agri inputs. I would ready to take up any questions if it is there. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kavita, for the presentation. And then take up some questions. Okay. What are some of the latest innovations in biological pest control methods for agriculture? Can you can you come again, ma'am? Oh, okay. What are some of the latest innovations in biological pest control methods for agriculture? Okay. Uh, so biological pest control methods, like if you see, there are a lot of uh, 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 you see a lot of insects. Like if you see the um, uh, you have other, we have the typical biocontrol, see, that is one thing. So we have trichoderma and uh, we have uh, pseudomonas, which is a universal biocontrol. And we also have other organisms, like we have 
lot of organisms which can actually uh, eat up the other organisms. Like in case of nematodes, we have a few of them which can actually act on other uh, nematodes. Similarly, in case of insects, thrips and aphids, we also have biocontrol insects that can be used like uh, uh, granodoma. A lot of other things can be used in order to uh, uh, decrease the uh, other, other pest and infects, uh, insects. Apart from that, we also have this uh, kytosin application, which uh, you must have heard of. So there are certain polymers which we can actually apply in order to this acts as a vaccine. So what happens is like uh, the layer, the, the cuticle layer of the insects have this uh, kytosin, which actually uh, in, in, in increases the innate immunity of the plants. So now when you apply kytosin, the, it is a simulation of an insect environment actually. So the plants assume that there is an insect and then the innate immunity is actually increased. Uh, so whenever there is an insect or pest attack, and then what happens is like um, this, this can actually be uh, uh, immediately the innate immunity affects them. It immediately, uh, immediately kills them. So this, these are the latest technologies. Like if you see, there are various organisms that we can use. So when you say pest, See, pest is actually a vector-borne disease. Like any type of bacteria, fungal, virus can be spread by one of the vectors, which are the insects. So, aphids, thrips. So, this is how it is. Uh, so, when you work against the aphids and thrips, automatically you can actually reduce your um, infestation, infestation with bacteria, fungus, and the virus. And if you see natural biomolecules, like we have azadiractin as a major uh, biomolecule that is used as a uh, pest control today and we also have this current uh, which people use the biological uh, oils that people use actually so these are some of them which i know there might be few of them which i i am not aware of but uh, there are a lot of other technologies and uh, the, 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 the other important thing is even hybrid varieties which are present today if you ask biological control, we can even actually bring in hybrid varieties which are actually having this innate immunity induced against certain type of uh, pest. So you see a lot of crops where you have this um, uh, uh, hybrids which actually um, prevent pest attack. Okay. And how do biological inputs contribute to improving soil health and fertility? Soil health and fertility. fertility. Okay. Okay. So when why do we say that biological improve, uh, inputs improve soil fertility? Uh, like when you when you say biological inputs, say like when I say azospirilla, bacillus megatherium, bacillus subtilis, anything that has a major PGPR function, when you apply this to the soil, it doesn't mean that these are the organisms that are going to exist throughout the uh, crop cycle or throughout the soil. Uh, uh, the existence. Actually, they are going to induce a battery of other organisms in the soil. So that's what happens. Uh, like when, when these other organisms get induced, they have certain properties by which these organisms can improve the soil quality or even the inherent qualities of these biofertilizers. Like for example, the most of these biofertilizer organisms, uh, uh, azospirillum or acetobacter, they can produce polymers like polyhydroxybutyrate, polyhydroxyalkanates. Now, so these polyhydroxybutyrate and polyhydroxyalkanates play a very important role in soil binding uh, properties. By doing that, they can improve the water retaining capacity of the soil. And the other interesting thing that these um, organisms Organisms also do is they liberate a lot of uh, uh, plant growth hormones. So that is one thing. They liberate siderophores, which actually, so this is basically nutrient deficiency. But if you see soil quality improvement, mainly production of uh, polymers, they produce certain organic acids and they also produce uh, certain, uh, like if you say, um, they, they have other, um, mainly they have the soil binding properties. So that is where they, and they also lead to production of other organisms, the induction of other organisms, which actually improves the decomposition of the agricultural waste or any other waste, and they improve the organic carbon of the soil by doing that. And uh, they also improve the soil texture. By degrading some part of the soil, they improve the soil particle size of the soil texture. This is how they are able to do that. Fertility of the soil is because of improvement of the organic carbon because like I told you, some other decomposing bacteria would get actually increased by these biologicals. And does, there are a lot of soil decomposing bacteria also. The cells are working on some of them, which actually improves the decomposition of the vegetative, vegetable waste or something and they lead to liberation of organic carbon, which is in turn an index of 
uh, improvement in the fertility of the soil. Mainly the carbon nitrogen ratio of the soil will be improved. And uh, can you explain how biotechnology is being used to develop more effective biological pesticides and fertilizers? Mm, uh, pesticides and? Fertilizers. Okay. So biotechnological tool, like if you see, uh, uh, if, if you see mainly uh, what we can, what we do is actually, we see target specific, like biologicals basically. So we uh, do the target specific, like we develop organisms which can actually um, uh, be antagonistic to the uh, biocontrol, the, the other uh, pesticide and the fungicide organisms. And uh, we find out those organisms, we actually then type them, we type them, we characterize them, and then we actually uh, start um, producing them in the fermenters and then increasing the thing. That is that is what we do normally. See, recombination is something that I'm not going to talk about because uh, in our country, still recombination is not something that we have uh, accepted in a, in a wide way because otherwise in other countries, they actually increase the gene copy of the, uh, the genes of which actually pr produce a disease resistance. And this can be actually applied in the field but here in our country we don't do recombination so it is purely physiological uh, modification so recombination or something if you want me to talk i'm not going to talk but biotechnology as a process chemistry has been helping because here what we do is there are a lot of enzymes double stranded rna a lot of those things of late has been introduced just uh, biocontrols that is uh, that is there uh, if you want to have some more detail what i can say is like um, uh, there are a few enzymes, like even if you see the, the Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, the triprotein is actually the uh, protein that is needed for the disease resistance. There are technologies now where the triprotein is actually produced in higher quantities and then we, by downstream processing, we actually purify them and then we give them as a product. So these triproteins actually, when the uh, insect or the thing feeds on them, then they actually stop their feeding further and the insects uh, die. This is the mechanism by which they act. So this is something that is uh, using biotechnology as, a, in, as an intervention too. Off late, this double standard RNA concept has come, this interferon I, interferon I concepts have come, wherein these actually go and inhibit the double standard viruses, RNA viruses, basically the mosaic virus and such sort of viruses in plants. So such products have started coming and these double stranded RNAs are basically expressed in yeast. So whether in the live form or in the dead form, these are applied as products. So some of the biotechnological intervention, we can call them as some of the biotechnological interventions. So yeah, if okay. I've answered your question. Yeah. And what are the main advantages of using biological inputs compared to traditional chemical methods in agriculture? Uh, the, the tradition, the traditional was never chemical methods. So chemical methods came in the 1970s, right? When green revolution uh, came and hit it. If you see the traditional methods, it's basically the crop cycling that people will do that leguminous crops and then comes the non-leguminous crops, the, the field crops. So that's how people were doing agriculture in the past. Apart from that, they use manure cow dung manure or green manure or any other type of manure in order to enrich the soil. Uh, so this is what was in the traditional method. And when you say conventional uh, fertilizer farming or the conventional farming, maybe we can we should call it the conventional farming today. This is actually using of uh, fertilizers. People use urea as a nitrogen source. They use DAP as a nitrogen and phosphorus source. We use potash. So these are the major macronutrient providers, the NPK. So when we use biologicals, we actually can reduce the chemicals in the sense because some of these biofertilizer bio organisms or PGPR organisms can actually fix the atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium. So the, uh, the nitrogen fertilizers can be drastically reduced, say by 50% or 25%. And uh, the other thing is like even the phosphorus and potassium, if you give them in lesser quantities, they are not, uh, no, they can be solubilized by your phosphorus solubilizing and potassium mobilizing in bacteria and then they can become more amenable for assimilation by the plant. So this is what the biologicals do to, does to the chemical fertilizers. Chemical fertilizers of course will increase the yield of the crop and that is how we've been doing uh, so far but in the due course what we have done is we have actually uh, reduced the fertility of the soil in the sense there is no life in the soil which can actually convert phosphorus potassium to a form 
that is absorbed by the plants. Now you need some amount of bacteria to do that. Now because of adding more and more chemicals, we have actually precipitated all the living organisms there, which again actually demands more of chemicals. That's what happens in more and more of soil degradation. So this is a problem with the chemical farming today. Today, that's a challenge that we are facing and we need to have biological alternatives. That is where uh, we are coming up with biological alternatives. Not only our company, a lot of biological alternatives that are uh, coming up very quickly because to address this issue of chemical fertilizers, we have to retrieve the soil. Only then even the normal nutrients can be taken back. Even the chemical nutrients can be taken up by the uh, plants. That is the situation in which we are. I think... Yeah, this is the basic difference. You cannot go completely biological. You cannot go completely uh, conventional farming. You have to have a mix, an integrated approach of biological and chemical farm. Okay. And how accessible are these technological advances in biological inputs to small-scale farmers in developing regions? Uh, okay. So in developing, the last part. Regions. In developing regions. Yes. Okay. All right. So you are uh, the is, are these technology available to farmers? That's what I have uh, understood this question. Yes, from Fipsol, we have we are already in the market. Like uh, if you see the gel technology is available in the market. We are available in four states. We don't market it directly, so we have partners who do that. So uh, we we develop technologies, but uh, the, the partners uh, market them. We are in the market. A lot of these technologies, if you see like um, uh, biofertilizers are given by the government to the farmers, but that is where the small challenges, like we are coming up with intervening uh, technologies to make them more robust. Uh, of course, they are in the market and at a price which is very well competitive. The farmers can easily afford uh, to them. That is what we are all aiming to do because it is not only for the farmers, it is also for us because ultimately we will also have to make a safer environment for ourselves and for our future generations. So that is, uh, it is available now uh, somewhere i do see that the cost of some of these are very high not now i'm not talking about the biofertilizers but basically the other uh, directed availability or even the current uh, availability so the active components are very very costly and there is still some uh, stringency in farmer getting most of these technologies but let us address these issues together and see to that that uh, these technologies are available to the farmer so that we have a more uh, protected and uh, uh, natural way of farming so yeah, some of these aren't available. I do accept it, but uh, uh, but we will see to that that at least whatever we are developing, we are developing at a price which we can actually help the farmers to improve. Yeah. So do we have any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any notable success stories or uh, case studies where biological inputs have significantly improved improved crop yields or quality? Uh, yeah, so that is what I just recently presented in my slides. I don't know, maybe I did. I wasn't clear. Uh, so whatever the presentation I was showing in the, the ten crops that we are we have been doing, uh, it, these are all mostly we have reduced the chemical fertilizers say by significantly 20 to 50 percent so that is what i showed in the table and then you see that the uh, output has in increased by 15 to 60 percent depending upon the crop and depending upon the type of um, integration of these bi biologicals into that uh, practice so this has happened and this this our uh, fibsol itself is a successful story and uh, we are almost there in uh, uh, like i told you like we have presence in four states and we are going aggressively Mm. marketing the product so that that way yes uh, there, there are success stories yes and uh, what challenges do farmers face in adopting and integrating biological inputs into their farming practices so the major challenge that they have is see the farmer pop like you cannot go and uh, uh, change the way that the farmer is applying because the, the problem with them is like you will have the manpower issues all that laborer issues and all that so we can't say you apply biological separately see the most of the problem that happens is when we go and say apply biological separately don't apply during the day or applying chemicals or insecticides when they are integrating uh, the chemical and the natural or the biological farming but uh, that is where Pipsol has come up with a solution like if you see our patent uh, also covers one point. So we've also coated this with chemical fertilizers or we have coated our product on chemical fertilizers. We have coated it with the, uh, coated it on urea and kept this for four to five hours where the bacterial count is not compromised. 
then we can within that four to five hours farmer can actually sow it on the field broadcast it on the field and uh, the moment it reaches the soil it will get get to the uh, soil region and start uh, surviving the bacteria so we've come up with easy methods where we can actually mix biologicals and uh, uh, chemicals so that the farmer doesn't have this issue of increasing the labor the main challenge you'll have is that you ask him to apply it on a separate day uh, the farmer doesn't find the time and the money for it. So we are, in at least in our technology, we are trying to address this issue. We are trying to integrate it uh, smartly with the chemical farming practices. Okay. And how do biological inputs contribute to sustainable agriculture practices and environmental conservation? All right, that is what I told you. The first thing that the biologicals do is reduce chemical fertilizers, which means we are going to the environmental uh, thing. Like I mentioned during the talk also, like one ton of chemical fertilizers during production lead to 1.5 ton of uh, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide emission. Now, by reducing chemical fertilizers by 50%, directly we reduce that. That is first thing. And second thing is, um, uh, like, like when you apply it on the soil, you're going to degrade the soil. Soil is getting degraded. The alkalinity of the soil increases. By leaching, it goes into the water bodies and it spoils uh, water and uh, water animals living there. And the air quality is also reduced when you apply uh, chemical fertilizers. So by reducing the chemical fertilizers and improving biologicals, we actually can uh, uh, reduce the carbon footprint. Now, this is going to be more natural. And uh, obviously, you aren't going to... Uh, uh, use much of these uh, chemicals so that is that is a main relevance that is how the sustainability and the environmental issue will be addressed by using biological of course the other added advantages would be the soil texture improves the organic carbon improve, in, improves the water, water retaining capacity improves and all the good things like the humic acid and the fulvic acid and all other secreted substances would also be improved so considering that the, the environmental uh, uh, benefits are going to be way high the only thing is having a good quality biological and delivering those biological in a, um, a stable form because today any delivery mechanism that is available in the market is not so robust to keep the bacteria alive for a longer time which is where Gibsol intervenes and gives a solution we keep the stability of these bacteria even in the most dire situation to 24 months so that is what uh, we do at uh, Gibsol uh, yes this is how it is going to address climate and uh, environmental concerns Okay, and uh, what role do bio my sorry what role do my microbial in uh, inoculants play in enhancing plant growth and disease resistance? Uh, that that is what I told you because they would uh, improve the nitrogen fixation. Basically, when you say nitrogen fixation, it converts atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium. So ammonium is the backbone of proteins, right? The plant uh, proteins, any protein, even human protein. So then the plants grow well. That's the first point. And the second point is like phosphorus and potassium is needed. Like I don't know, people say root growth and all that. As a scientist, phosphorus and potassium is needed for all the metabolic pathways of the plant. Any metabolic pathway, uh, I don't know how many of you here knows uh, biochemistry, but uh, phosphorus is the backbone of the DNA. Potassium forms the voltage gated channels. So a lot of other things, enzymes, hormones, most of them have these constituents. So then uh, you increasing macronutrient in general is going to improve the plant uh, growth. And it is also going to improve the immunity because they also secrete certain molecules, signaling molecules, which actually induces the innate immunity of the plant. Innate immunity is a native immunity that the plants will develop against diseases. So that is what biologicals are going to do. And last question, how are advancements in genetic engineering impacting the development of bio-fortified crops for improved and nutrition and resilience? That is what we are eating today. So like most of the crops that are uh, available today, the hybrid varieties that we have today, most of them are using one way or the other, they are genetically modified. And uh, like if you see, we have uh, we have disease resistance, we have biotic stress or abiotic stress resistance, we have saline. That's what I've mentioned. Biotic and abiotic includes all type of stresses. It could be saline stress, it could be heat stress, it could be uh, any other stress through the pest and the um, uh, the the aphids and crypts. Any type of stress today, uh, there are crop varieties that are made resistant to them. Like if you know this BT. Bt was something that was made resistant. It had the cry protein 
basically vessellus thuringiensis ka kar i put it was there in the pt cotton and bt print john like instead of applying vessellus thuringiensis on the crop as a biocontrol why don't we inherently make them uh, code for that uh, cry protein was the concept in that simple as simple as that so like that uh, there are a lot of crop, uh, crop varieties today any type of crop varieties that we are uh, hybrid varieties that we are having is basically drought resistance and all this is actually uh, conferred to the uh, plant by genetic engineering, basically. So that is very common. Where you cannot do genetic engineering is the biological inputs. We have accepted genetic engineering in uh, seed varieties, but genetic engineering in biological inputs like the bacterial genetic uh, variation, the, the bacteria that has to be applied on the field, that we haven't accepted. And why we haven't accepted is because uh, the it is because of the variability and the uh, amount of diversity that the country has today. Uh, because the moment you put start putting genetically modified organisms with the level of the diversity we have, we don't know what effects it would bring in and uh, the effects would become very massive and immense. So that is one reason why we aren't introducing genetically modified bacteria as biological inputs in the country considering the threat that we would be undergoing and considering the amount of population that we have in the country, amount of agricultural land we have in the country. India is the second largest agricultural country in the world. So considering that, that's why we aren't allowing genetically modified bacteria into the, the thing, inoculant uh, space, but we are allowing genetically modified seed varieties into the uh, space. Yeah. Yeah, one second. So I would love okay. to take yeah. some of these questions on the mail as well because I have a hard stop at three. And there is no, that's okay. We have, we have just, okay. Uh, I'm, we have completed the questions. Okay, Ms. Kavita. So now we have come to end of question round. On behalf of agriculturalinformation.com, we'd like to thank you for the detailed presentation and answering all the questions in depth. And we also like to thank our uh, editorial team for sharing the questions. The meeting will now be closed. Thank you for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.